studying monsters. Even in my math problem, my teacher would ask, there are four American bastards. You killed two of them. How many American bastards left to kill? <laughs> so that was the math I was solving. And I remember every room in North Korea, we have to have the portraits of dictators. Kim Jong-il, Kim Il-sung, and his wife and his son, Kim Jong-un. And if the house caught fire, the first thing that my family were teaching me is, don't run for your life. You have to protect the portraits with your life. Because if you fail to protect the portraits, the three generations of your family is gone. And the very first lesson that my mom told me as a young girl, I still remember, is that she said, don't even whisper, because the birds and mice could hear me. She said the most dangerous thing that I had in my body was actually my tongue. If I said one wrong word, it was going to kill up to eight generations of my family from my mom, my dad's side. So I learned not to even whisper. And when you cannot talk, of course, it leads to not be able to think. So North Koreans don't even know what critical think thinking is. And so that's from just a, a sample of growing up. What, what do you think is accurate information about North Korea is so hard to come by in the West? Mm -hmm. What are some of the things you think are, are most um, misunderstood or own, unknown by, America, by Americans, by Westerners? About, uh, about the Hermit Kingdom. Yeah, I think this is where I come to the West, and as you said, among the 200 defectors, I'm like one of them. It's, a, it's in a way, it's a miracle. And people ask me normally, like, why there's no revolution inside North Korea? Like, are you guys so dumb? <laughs> are you guys just all collectively idiots, like walking around, right? Don't know that we are, like, it's injustice. And it turns out, if you look up, actually, North Korea is one of the highest IQs nation as a demographic. So that is not true. That it's not because people there's no revolution because people are dumb. The reason that we don't rise up is because we don't know that we are slaves. We don't know that we are oppressed. We are oppressed to the point where government removes the words like liberty, freedom, human rights, or even love. We don't understand the concept of these words. And this is a perfect example by the George Orwell in 1984. He talks about double speak. In the fact that you don't have the word means you don't understand the concept. So because people in North Korea don't understand the concept of justice and oppression, they cannot be about revolution because they don't know what's wrong with them. And that's why, till this day, government can continue to enslave the people and create the biggest, the largest concentration camp in human history. So by controlling the language, you control the people. Control the thinking. And that's the importance of free speech yeah. here in America as well. Mm -hmm. I appreciate that. Um, you, you, st you share so many stories in the, in the, in the book, in, in Law Remain. The one that struck me in particular is your recounting of arithmetic yeah. and, and math growing up. And so uh -huh. can you share with us uh, what does one plus one equal and why? Right, so this is where I went to Columbia University. My university professors at the Ivy League school were telling us that <coughs> math is made up by the white men to control the minority. And I remember my very first lesson in North Korean school from my teacher. She said when they asked me, like, what is one plus one? You guys know the answer, what is one plus one? <laughs> right, you can be more confident than that. <laughs> I said two, and my teacher said, wrong. She said, my dear leader at the time, Kim Jong-il, uh, Jong one day added one drop of water to another drop of water. What does it become? It's not two, it becomes a bigger one. So that's how he proved that math were made up by the greedy capitalists in the West to control the minority. And the exact same lesson were taught in the 21st century at Columbia University. So, you know, after all, I didn't escape that far from the tyranny, I guess. <laughs> yeah. um, no, I appreciate it. And so, it, it, I think it is worth you recounting. Can you just 
share and spend some time talking about you know, from you know, how you made the decision? Can you walk us through leaving North Korea um, and then what, what followed? I should say escaping. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so being in North Korea is like in a way being in a different planet. As we cannot imagine life in some other planet right now, it's like that. I've never seen the map of the world. North Korea has a different calendar. Our calendar doesn't begin when Jesus Christ was born. It begins when Kim Il Sung was born. They don't even tell us that we are Asians. They tell us that we are our dear leader's race, Kim Il Sung's race. So I had no clue that there were like more than like 200 countries in the world and this many continents and different races exist. Uh, luckily, I was living in the border town of North Korea. And I heard that you guys saw the satellite picture of North Korea yesterday, right? Mm -hmm. It is a complete darkest. Mm -hmm. And from that darkness, I was able to see light coming from Chinese side at nighttime. And I thought, if I go where the lights were, I could find the bowl of rice, because uh, every day in North Korea was survivor to find food. And the ultimate reason I escaped from North Korea was not finding to become free or going anywhere. It was just really searching for food. And so you make it across the border. Yeah. And then, and then what happened? So I was 13 years old in 2007, and I'm like now 80 pounds. By the time I was like half of my size. <laughs> and we were able to cross the frozen river into China and initially with my mother. And the reason why these people were helping me to cross this border was because uh, they were selling us as a sex slaves. So you guys know that China had a one-child policy. The Communist Party, when they thought it'd be a good idea, people have only one kid. So so many people in China were aborting girls and keeping the boys. So now they are lacking 33 million women. So 33 million young men in China currently cannot find wives. So they demand sex slaves from North Korea. And that's where we ended up in China when we escaped from that Yellow River into China. Yeah. And so your your experience in China, um, I want to make sure, are there any other thoughts that you would like to share about the Communist Party? <laughs> Chinese Communist Party? Yeah, uh, so this is why I'm here today in a way, is that uh, even though only 220 of us make it to America currently, there are 300,000 North Korean women in China currently. And you think that being sold as a sex slave is the kind of the worst thing can happen to a young girl. But actually not. There are four places when we cross that frozen river in China we end up. Is number one place that we end up in China is a organ harvesters. Uh, they buy our body and then they tie us and then they harvest, harvest our organs while we are alive. Mm -hmm. And because that's how you can get the freshest organs out. And then they can just discard our body. And this is a common thing I heard from Chinese brokers who were telling me these days that I was worth less value than pigs. Because at least pigs, people notice if they get killed. But when North Koreans die, nobody would notice. The second place that we end up in China as nurse defectors is a brothers. I've been to brothers myself. Is they put a twin size bed in a room. There's no window, and they put a girl in that room and don't give her even food and let her wait for 500 times a day. And the pain is so much they give her the drug. So usually these girls last more than like not even up to six months, usually three months, they die from malnutrition and disease. And easier for them to buy a new girl because they sold my mom for $65. And they sold me for over $200 because I was a child virgin. And somehow in China, child virginity is more expensive. And the last place that we end up is a 
the village of men in the countryside cannot afford one woman, so they chip in in an entire village. So like 100 guys chip in and buy a one girl, and they rape the girl continuously throughout the village until she dies and they buy a new girl. Uh, I came to America to raise this awareness and there was even one day a Hollywood production company picked up my first book, wanted to make a movie about the reality of North Korean women in China. And then he sent me a script one day. And in the script that is developed by current Hollywood in America is saying that America was my promised land. They gave me refugee and gave me a protection. This modern day slavery is happening. It happened to myself, my sister, my mother, but nobody can speak out because of mainstream media and American Hollywood is keep lying to American people. And the, this reality is not known among the American public right now. Well, no, after today, this many people and everyone that we speak to will know. So yeah. thank you, I appreciate it. Um, can you share more about your your family um, and their journey? Your 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 mother and I mean I know. I, just can yeah. Can you just sh share something about the your, your sister and, and your mother and your father? Um, I escaped my mother initially, and then they sold me and my mother separately. And then a few days before my escape, my sister also escaped, and. She was sold, of course, by herself. Uh, and today is like off the record, so she was trafficked for seven years. I was trafficked for two years, and she was forced to have a baby, as as herself being a baby. And I found her seven years later in South Korea. Uh, she came to South Korea not knowing that my mother and I made it to South Korea prior. We got reunited for the first time in China. Uh, remaining family that I left behind in North Korea, they all got killed because I spoke out against the vision. And as I said, they go after three generations families. So all my mother and father's side have died because I spoke out. And so, you make it to South Korea. Yeah. You make it to freedom. Yeah. And you eventually make your way. Well, maybe let me back up. Um, once you got to South Korea, what was your experience um, as being from the north? You know, tell us a bit about, about what, what that was like. Uh, so, I want to give a credit to the people who actually rescued me, right? Because yeah. I was in China as a sex slave and. I did not know there was a way out of that course of life. And then one day I met another North Korean defector woman. She said, oh, I somehow there are Christian missionaries coming from South Korea rescuing North Korean defectors. And until that point, I did not know what religion was. Because in North Korea, in communism, you kill the gods, right? You kill the religions. There's no religion. and. Then I had a phone call with these missionaries, and they said there was a way to be out and go, free, go to a free country. And as a North Korean, like I never heard the word free, right? So I asked this person, like, what do you mean I'm going to be free in South Korea? Like, how would you explain freedom to a North Korean, right? And this person did a perfect job. She said, Suni, if you go to South Korea, you can wear jeans and you can watch K-dramas. <laughs> and nobody gonna arrest you for that. Because in North Korea, jeans are made in America, therefore the symbol of capitalism. They send you prison cap for wearing jeans. And they literally kill people for watching K-dramas and Hollywood movies. So I said, like, how do I go a place where people can choose to wear their pants and watch TV? And they said, in order to us to go to South Korea, we had to walk across the frozen Gobi Desert from Mongolia. And then they gave me a compass. So that was in 2009, when I was 15 years old. Uh, we walked across the frozen Gobi Desert in minus 40 degrees. 
and by some miracle we didn't get killed and then that's how I ended up in South Korea because of those Christian missionaries that were rescuing us. So you talked about some initial lessons at Columbia and one of the things you write in the book and I just want to I think it's such an important thing for us to really mm -hmm. understand. You write, quote, the true aim of anti-capitalism is not justice or social betterment. It is to narrow the boundaries in which people are capable of thinking for themselves. The freedom that capitalism grants to individual human beings to think and act for themselves, thereby accumulating wealth. It is the reason it is under increasing suspicion <laughs> in America today. And it, it struck me, you know, this is, th these are the stakes. Mm -hmm. When, um, when we're, we're here in America, we're hearing about ESG as communism coming to the back door. You know, what, what has your own um, experience here in the States um, taught you about the, the threats that we're facing to the capitalist free enterprise system? Yeah, so uh, very first thing I remember at Columbia at the orientation, my instructors were saying, all the problems that we have and we had in the past is because of greedy capitalism and because of white men and the Western civilization. And I was thinking like, are you guys a psychopath or something? <laughs> <laughs> you, you live in the best country in human history. I mean, today I woke up in my nice bed in this hotel they were like raining outside. And I was thinking in North Korea, now I've been worrying about the rainwater is leaking. Mm -hmm. And now I've been thinking about starting the fire and the wood gets wet. It's impossible to start fire to cook the meal, right? Without capitalists, how would I have a warm shower? How would I have took the airplane coming here? How would I have this clothes, right? But this is why the communists hate capitalists, is that this is like what, when I, my father got arrested, sent to prison camp in North Korea because he was engaged in the black market trading. <coughs> black market means in North Korea by selling sugar and dried fish. It's not drugs or weapons. The reason why they hate trading is that once you trade for yourself, you really start thinking for yourself, right? You got thinking about the, what are the needs that I can meet as a person. The capital is not about making money. It's a meeting the needs of the people or creating the needs for the people, like creating the iPhone. Until that, like how did we know that we could use an email on our phone? I asked my classmates at Columbia, like, why do you guys hate America so much? Why do you have to hate capitalism so much? And they said, look outside. There are homeless people on the street and there are cap like billionaires. Capitalism creates inequality. And I'm like, so would you rather live in a country where there's no billionaires? There's no room to rise. We are all equal, but collectively eating dragonflies and cockroaches. Is that what you want? I would rather live in a country where anybody can be a billionaire, can create a plane, can create a rocket, can create an iPhone, and be a billionaire. And these, they deserve that. We should celebrate people's success not people's misery and somehow equality of outcomes. And but then I grew up eating like bugs. Like when I remember with my friends, I have a son right now and he has like Star Wars series toys, he has a Legos, Play Dohs. I grew up playing with my friends catching cockroaches. Once you catch a cockroach, boys are faster than me. They catch a cockroach, they open their belly and inside they look something like a brown rice thing and they put in their mouth. And I wasn't fast enough to catch this box. You say that, but when you're starving, you'll be so grateful for cockroach to come your way. <laughs> and, and then my friends at Colombia, they choose to starve themselves. They're vegans. They're on a green juice detox. Seriously, they're on this green juice detox. They uh, choose not to eat the meat and telling me they're oppressed because they have so much things here. Like having an abundance is a problem for these people. <laughs> so last question, and then uh, then we'll open it up. So we were, we were talking, you said you spent a lot of time talking on college campuses. Um, what 
what, what is the one thing that sticks out to you the most going to uh, the, the university and, and, and just being in academia in the States? It, it does seem that whenever I go to college campuses, especially the Ivy League schools, right? Like, <laughs> you, I do quite realize that not having a problem is an actual problem. <laughs> <laughs> Because they don't have an actual problem, actual challenges, now they are creating 10,000 different pronouns. And if somebody does not get their Z, X, Y, Z pronouns, it's their oppression, right? They need to create a problem out of thin air. And I do think this comes from not understanding the, what it means to be free. So last year, I became American ambassador myself. <laughs> I became a citizen, American citizen. <laughs> uh, in Chicago in January last year, and then now like South Korean intelligence uh, were telling me, okay, now you're American citizen, they don't accept your citizenship. So like, now I'm sure like FBI is gonna do a better job to protecting you because until that point. South Korean intelligence was protecting me. They would be telling me that I was on the killing list of Kim Jong-un, what country to avoid, where the agents of North Korea are operating. So they did a really good job keeping me alive until last year I became an American citizen. So I, I got a call that month somehow. FBI in Texas were calling me to come to their office and share my story with them so they can understand better what's happening to North Korean people. So, Fantastic, like FBI finally calling me and they want to protect me. But then, two days before my event, the head of diversity within FBI calls me. Did you know that's a job? <laughs> Somebody's job is a head of diversity. And this lady calls me on the phone and saying, we have to cancel your speech because of your political opinions. But then same week, I became a citizen in Chicago. My interviewer asked me, have you ever persecuted anybody for their political opinion? If I said yes, I could not become an American. This country currently is run by the people who currently does not understand what it means to be American, what it means to be a nation of free citizens. I think the entire that staff at FBI need to be stripping their citizenship right now. <laughs> the problem is these people never took a citizenship test. And I think that's what, you, what I see at the college campuses and, and anybody. People don't know what it means to be free and what it means to be American. And that's why we are losing the way of American right now. That's well said. I w want to open it up uh, for <laughs> folks who have questions. Uh, we've got microphones. I can say this without a mic. Yeah. As Americans, is there any way we can help North Koreans? Oh, so sad hearing your story. Thank you. They are, I mean, <laughs> best way, only way we can solve North Korean problem is a uh, through China. Oh, uh, people don't understand this. Like Kim Jong Un doesn't exist by himself. He is sponsored, run by China currently, by CCP, and currently in Hollywood or even in DC, nobody wanna stand up against China. If you look at Biden's family, they make so much money through China, they don't wanna ask Xi Jinping to sponsor like this quick, this misery of 25 millions of people. So the only way we can fundamentally solve this problem is through China, and we, and we are the only nation who can stand up against China. So we can elect white people in the office, can challenge and hold them accountable. And also, there are missionaries currently still rescuing North Korean defectors through China to freedom. So if you want to get, get involved in the rescue mission, I'll be more than happy to connect you to these missionaries who are risking their lives and rescuing North Koreans. And then lastly, there are foundations that sending leaflets. Uh, do you guys remember during the Germany division? Yeah. They were sending leaflets to send information to the, the other side. Uh, we do that. This is called broom launches. We do the DMZ in South Korea. We send leaflets through the border to South North Korea so North Korean people know that 
they are oppressed and they are enslaved by the dictatorship and that Kim Jong-un is not a god, he's a fat dictator. <laughs> <laughs> like all of us. I, I did not know he was a human being like us. I was so brainwashed that I believed that he was a god. And then I got to South Korea. This person saying like, he's not a god. Like, he's a fat person. I'm like, no, why are you talking about he's starving just like us? And he showed me a picture one day. Look. Everybody is so skinny and he's the only fat guy in the picture. <laughs> <laughs> and that's why we are trying to, to teach North Korean people that Kim Jong-un is not a god and they can fight back if they want to. <laughs> yeah, that's a question. Yeah. Um, Hello. Yeah, I'm so glad you're here. I, I loved your books and I'm so glad I got to meet you before. And I've been searching all over the web for uh -huh. a Nonprofit that you might have, and I look at your Wikipedia account, and my God, it's unbelievably horrible. They just they just crucify you. Yeah. Like, <laughs> Got to be taken care of. But do you actually have a nonprofit of your own? Oh, uh, I mean that's what they claim, but I don't have a nonprofit. I don't do a personal fundraising at all. Uh, I there are something like Human Rights Foundation in New York. Or there are pastors that does get the fund I can connect, and this is the thing. This year, writing this book, criticizing the work in America, uh, the New York Times and the Washington Post comes out and saying, "How do we know? How do we believe that she what she's saying yeah. is true? Because we don't go into North Korea." So that's interesting, right? Like that's it's understandable in some way, but then five years ago. Literally five years ago, I was criticizing President Trump meeting Kim Jong-un without getting any concession, right? Legitimizing him. And I do think Trump had a good intention, but did not understand quite what it meant for the North Korean people to see that American president sitting next to Kim Jong-un in an equal position, mm -hmm. right? That solidified the North Korean people think that Kim Jong-un is that powerful, even though he's a terrorist. So I was criticizing Trump, President Trump, and they had no problem putting me on their front page. At the time, they didn't have to quite question my credibility. <coughs> now they question my credibility because I'm criticizing the work. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So until that point, like when President Trump was saying that mainstream media is the enemy of the American people, I thought he was exaggerating. My staff creating the content zone, I have a YouTube channel and I try to talk about this issue. So remember during the pandemic, right? We could not leave our homes. Um, Chinese human traffickers developed their tool in a way where ordering a girl is like ordering Uber Eats. You hit a few buttons, then a girl <laughs> delivered to your home in China to get raped. In their like Chinese Baidu is Chinese Google. So I made this video and try to expose this to people what they were doing during the pandemic. And then Google censors my videos every single time. And I get shadow banned, I get blocked. So I reached out to Google and it's like, you guys were supporting Me Too. Remember the Me Too? Yeah. They were saying, believe her, believe her what she's saying. You guys say that women get sexually harassed and why are you not supporting Me Too of North Korean women in China? They say, oh, we just, it does not meet our guidelines. <laughs> so it's just the bias of American media. They are the one tearing Americans apart. Yeah. What's beautiful America to me when I came here is that somehow the trust that we have. I got into Uber driver yesterday, come here, believing that this guy gonna protect me and take me to airport and not taking my organs out and raping me. I order food and believing that there's no pre poison and rats and somebody not feeding me with a good food. America, capitalism operates with a trust. In North Korea, there's no trust because everybody's spy. Even you and I are nice. Like, if there are three of us in a spy, you have to spy on me, I have to spy on her. So I'm not being a nice person, not gonna report on her, but you have to report on me. But then you are spied on by somebody else. You cannot escape this paradigm. So the fact that nobody can trust anybody in North Korea, and it was exactly the same in Colombia. If you see something, say something. It's not about finding a bond. 
if you say something, see something that somebody question the truth, this gender ideology, you gotta be proud of them so we can punish them. And now I see that Americans don't trust each other. I spoke at TED, and they were saying, oh, where are you guys heading now? So I'm going to Texas, and they were like, why are you selling a food of Trump country? <laughs> the people at TED, People who run Google, Facebook, all these big technology companies, they say they sworn that they're never gonna set a foot on a side where people like vote conservative. And like, I don't know if we don't trust each other. It's a perfect time for dictator to rise and control people. And I think that's where we are headed right now. Like becoming like North Korea every single day. Woo. Uh, yeah. Oh, you want me to use this? Uh, this, this concerns China, mm -hmm. and you mentioned China, but uh, I spent some time in China, um, all over the country in 2007. But uh, just a couple months ago, I met a couple. They are we're in the banking business here in the United mm -hmm. States. They are from China, and they're retired. They are now citizens here, but when I try to bring up things like mm -hmm. organ harvesting, they mm -hmm. say that's propaganda. It doesn't happen, and then I try to bring up this, um, and I know they do have an agenda, Shen Yang, that, that uh -huh. goes over, absolutely beautiful, but they have an agenda, and I talked to them about that, and they said that that is also propaganda. So it's frustrating to have these, um, these Chinese Americans, they're enjoying citizenship that they truly believe, I mean, I think they're very sincere, mm -hmm. but they have told me, they said, I need to go with them to China to see what's really happening, because China is a much better place today than it was when I was there in 2007. This is what they keep telling me. So they're they're denying that organ harvesting is occurring in that country. They say that it's just in one area on the border. Mm -hmm. So how do I deal with something like that where they're enjoying the freedoms but they're still believing mm -hmm. exactly what um, they want the, the world to believe? You know that this is happening, but you've obviously seen it. And um, I just wonder how you deal with people that are here, enjoying freedoms, but yet still feeling the same way. Uh, it's pure propaganda. Right. I think, so, to me is that, when they say like the conservatives are fascists, I'm like, really, do you think so? Because to me is that the fact that Chinese Americans can hold that belief is a testament to the tolerance of American system. Right, in North Korea, if somebody praises capitalism, you get executed. We are living in a country where like AOC thrives, <laughs> Bernie yeah. Sanders thrives. So I think it, to me as an individual, it's fine that whatever they want to believe in, but it's a concerning that more people find that uh, story. Mm -hmm. But now even China is not getting better. Like the American lab of the DEI, this all like the woke profits, is it cutting the social credit system China is operating on? The Chinese social credit is like, how many times did you criticize the Xi Jinping online, right? Depending on your loyalty to the, the Communist Party, you, your job, your opportunity to go to school, or get a loan depended on. And North Korea has the same uh, thing. So North Korea, even though it's a socialist paradise, we have 51 different caste systems. Is it, so they are dividing people based on how America divides people based on their skin color, right? If you're white, you're privileged. Your ancestors are the slaves, like that. If your ancestors were landowners or capitalists, now your genetics is oppressive. And then among these 51 caste systems, there are three big categories. We call them actually not, in their fruit names. So top third is a royal class is called uh, tomatoes. You're red inside, you're red outside. Therefore, there's no doubt that you believe in communism. Therefore, you are royal class and the top third. The second third in the middle is called the wavering class, is apple. You are red outside, but you're white inside. Therefore, you're questionable. We quite not know if you actually truly believe it or you are pretending to believe it. Therefore, you need government surveillance. Number third, last one, is a, something called a hostile class. They named their third population called the hostile class. You are great. You're so screwed because you're not even red outside. You are great, therefore, you are definitely sympathizing the capitalism and democracy. The government's gonna persecute you. 
generation after generation, there's no ending, there's no ending of this persecution by your own government. But the class you belong to is not up to you. It's up to your ancestors. Who do we choose our ancestors, right? <laughs> there's no redemption in communism. Like, we didn't choose our skin color. They punish you for something they didn't do. Now I have a son. I was robbed in Chicago a few years ago, and that's why I left. I was robbed by a few black women during the pandemic, and then they were punching me and they took my wallet out. And then I was trying to call the police, people on the street circling me and saying I'm the racist, that I'm trying to call on these criminals who are punching me and taking my wallet away. They decide that somebody cannot be a, a persecutor or a victim because these people had a certain skin color. Yeah. And that's where we are going to. They call my son that privileged class because he's a half Asian, half white. And whatever he succeeds in life, I know that American society gonna tell him, because of your privilege, his hard work gonna never credit to his perseverance and resilience is because of his like privilege. But when somebody messes up, they're gonna say, oh, because you're you're oppressed, you know? Because if you fail at like math and graduating English. Or because of your ancestors, like child slavery that you experience, they say let's abolish English exam, history exam, and math exam, right? Yeah. They abolish SAT, and that they say that, and because of some people cannot pass it because of their ancestors. <laughs> so where does this end? Never. And that's like exactly how we becoming divided, like Northern people divided by our ancestor crime. Now in America, we are in a different caste system. And then also, just to just quickly, um, one of the organizations that a number of folks in the room support is something called Victims of Communism Memorial Foundation. Over a year ago, they released an exhaustive, hundreds of page report, all open source reporting, documenting the or organ harvesting program in China. So we'll we'll include that with, with what we send out. So this isn't, you know, this is this is this is happening. Yeah. Uh, so I think we got time for one, one more question. I think I speak for the room when I say you are an inspiration. <laughs> you have seen and experienced so much bad, mm -hmm. and yet you tell jokes, and <laughs> you smile, and you are an activist. How? Yeah. Oh. <laughs> Thank you, though. So, uh, I remember when I was writing my first book, In Order to Live, uh, my editors in New York were saying to me, like, Yanmi, you are traumatized. You have PTSD, so you need to go see a therapist. <laughs> <laughs> and then she's like, this therapist is so kind. She normally charges seven fifty per hour, but she's like, only charge you about $200 per hour. And I was thinking, you know, in North Korea, they don't have the word depression. Mm -hmm. Because, like, how can you be depressed living in a socialist paradise? <laughs> right? <laughs> so, government just deleted that word for us. <laughs> and I was thinking, I literally live in a country where there's a concept of PTSD exists. <laughs> and I was like, of course I don't need the like therapy. Uh, and this is where it, still to this day, it's, Sad because Americans are so kind and it's in a way like overdo it in some sense that they think if somebody goes through a slavery rape on seeing like I saw my mother getting raped and every guy that I met when I was 13 was my rapist and they're like oh how can you trust men it's like because my father was a man he was a good man I'm not gonna judge men through all one rapist I met and then seeing all men are toxic and oppressive, right? And they somehow expect the, the victims not to be resilient and bounce back. And this is the thing, like humans are a lot stronger than we think. In front of death, guys, we can like literally move a mountain. That kind of strength is within us. That's why America exists. That's why how our founding fathers come here and create a nation like this, because we are so much stronger than we know. But this modern culture in America keep reminding that you need a safe space. 
Nobody challenges you with words. Not physically attacking you, but words. Because words can kill you, apparently, at Columbia University. <coughs> and I think we need to remind Americans that we are stronger than we know. And we can overcome so much. And that's why when I, my son comes to complain little things, I don't accept it. It's like, well, get over it. Shake it off. You can have a good day. Thank you. Well, let me do what we're thinking so much. Oh,